We're live. Welcome, uh, everybody, back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center, CUNY in New York City in Manhattan at City University. And uh, another day in uh, New York, another day on planet Earth, and another day um, with uh, COVID. Um, it's uh, uh, still uh, uh, evolving and developing and in a rapid rapid uh, uh, speed. Uh, we are still in a moment of great uncertainty. We do not know what actually what is happening. We don't know what will happen. And perhaps we also don't really fully know what already happened that led to, to um, all of this. New York City is, uh, of course, uh, so very much uh, uh, affected by this was for a very long time the epicenter was over a thousand thousand two hundred infection it was down now to 20 uh, per day last uh, week which is a great testimony to uh, to the new yorkers and for listening and for respecting but of course um we do not know what uh, the second third fourth or fifth wave will bring wave will bring uh, 60 000 infections again yesterday in the u.s uh, it is the fifth day of record uh, infections. Um, we don't really know uh, um, how this could be compared to other in countries, uh, other nations. Um, more and more it becomes clear it's because of a disastrous leadership um, of uh, responses that don't serve the people, that didn't protect the people, that didn't take that as serious uh, as they should have been in the beginning. And the same for now, the president refuse, refuses to wear a mask, uh, um, now pushes for opening of schools in the fall uh, for normal uh, high schools and kindergartens even so numbers are against it and he threatens to take away subsidies and uh, funding if not uh, our international students um, are uh, threatened not to get a visa not to be able to study at the university or at other universities Harvard and MIT filed a lawsuit I think yesterday against this uh, reckless and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, truly um, um, outrageous uh, uh, decision that came um, out of the blue. All theaters still, of course, are closed in New York City. No indoor dining. So many restaurants bought food for indoor dining for the 50% uh, openings that was promised. But the numbers um, are so high that uh, um, Cuomo went back. And New York City um, is uh, also experiencing uh, strange things. It looks like and it's really called like it's the Corona neighborhood in Queens um, has 68% or 70% of infection of everybody on the street. So it's almost herd immunity. People were affected much, much more. And often, of course, it is a more immigrant diverse neighborhood that uh, is three times as affected uh, than the white people and die two times more by the rate. So um, we really do not know and what is happening. There are questions on Cuomo who sent back uh, COVID patients from the hospitals into the old age homes. And of course, we also know so many people died in the old age homes. So many workers were infected, it's over a thousand. And uh, so we are all, of course, now second, um, second guessing um, if this uh, was right. Um, we uh, have over 3 million infections in uh, the US. We have over 3 million in Latin America and half a million in Africa, by the way, and uh, but things are looking complicated in Brazil, in, uh, in India especially uh, now, and Puerto Rico most probably now is experiencing one of the most complicated times of the state of the US. So uh, it's the fifth catastrophe, I think, in four, five, six years. It is uh, quite uh, stunning the time you live through. We heard yesterday from uh, Japan, uh, from an update uh, from Satoko and um, what uh, artists are going through. They are opening actually theaters in Japan. It looked like uh, it was all behind and all of a sudden now also Japan is closing again, neighborhoods, <laughs> restaurants, streets, and uh, trying to contain to contain it. We all of course think what what is the role of the arts? What is the role of theater? Theater has been hit so hard that will be, they were the first to close, that will be the last to open next to massage salons uh, um, because it is a work with the body, is a representation with the body and the public uh, 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 gathering of a community, everything that makes uh, 
life and uh, a community great. Um, and as we always say, a great theater is a reward for a great society, a great community, a community that takes care of itself. And if it's not the case, there is no good theater or no theater at all as we have it now. Um, it always depends, of course, on the people who run these institutions where artists have been on the right side of social justice, of the complex struggle for freedom and liberties. And these artists anticipate the future or they are in, in the moment closer to the present than we all are. And uh, one of the leaders uh, in New York City um, is uh, Nigel, Nigel Smith, who we know for a long time. He also was at Prelude and he took over the Flea uh, Theater in New York City, which uh, he inherited a system, um, uh, how it worked, how it produced, and, uh, and now is in the middle of that storm, in the middle of the COVID, uh, having a theater that cannot produce theater, having artists who cannot work, um, having to redefine the, the mission, um, which is the role of every artistic director. Nigel is primarily a director, and he did do the great work of the free, the Sussman Promises from Thomas uh, Pretcher. He worked a lot with the great Taylor Mac, um, the holiday sauce, but also the, the, the now legendary uh, 24 decade history of popular music, uh, uh, a landmark piece, I think, of the decade um, also. And uh, so many uh, institutions he worked for and uh, centers, museums. Um, he is also board member of ART, of Art New York, of the, the union of uh, New York nonprofit theaters. So I was five, 600 members, I think, and he's an activist an artistic activist organization, uh, the Willing Participants, where he's a ringleader that whips up urgent poetic responses to crazy shit that happens. Um, so, uh, Nigel, thank you for joining us. I know how much you have on your mind, how much you have to deal with or had dealt with. How, where are you at the moment? Uh, Frank, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this, I think, really important project. I am uh, thankfully with family uh, and I'm in rural North Carolina today. Is this where you grew up? Yes, I grew up down here in North Carolina, so back home. Back home, yeah, I heard here some sunburn. So were your parents, were they part of theater? Were they a wolf in the theater world? No, uh, not in, not in the professional sense. You know, uh, my mom, uh, she is a laborer. Uh, when I was growing up, she was working in screen printing, uh, and now she works for Walmart. Uh, my dad um, worked in uh, it was a, it was a cotton mill, so textiles are big. So uh, and then moved into actually um, became a, a a guard at a local prison. Uh, so uh, that was my that's more than my parents started, but uh, church and particularly the Pentecostal church tradition uh, is what I, the faith system I grew up in. Uh, and it is, it, it is theatrical, you know, it is the kind of space where you walk in on any given Sunday and you don't know how long you're gonna be there. Uh, because there's a, there's a call and response, there is an improvisation to it. Uh, if, if someone's spirit is moved to dance, then the drummer picks up the beat and that dance happens, that praise dance happens. Or if someone wants to sing a certain song, that song starts to rise and the rest of the congregation joins in that song. Uh, who knows how long the, the homily is going to go on. So uh, I, I, I think that even though it wasn't a professional sense, that was sort of the, the theatrical breeding uh, space for me and you know not only would we go to you know those services and to revivals and to Sunday school but then me and my cousins would go and recreate that in our front yard or or make up new stories um, so uh, yeah mm. So were you a singer? Were you a singer in the chorus? <laughs> I thought I was a singer <laughs> I tried to sing. <laughs> Did you participate as a young uh, man? Uh, yes yeah very much so I mean I uh, all the pageants we would do, uh, holiday pageants, you know, singing in the kids' chorus, uh, being a leader in Sunday school, it was all, it was all there. Yeah. It's all there. So is the time of COVID a reconnection for you now, for you lose your roots? Yeah, I, um, one of the things that was so fascinating to me at the very beginning is uh, how, how quickly I started to be in deep and continual uh, conversation and uh, engagement with particularly my parents, you know, uh, and my youngest brothers, you know, uh, you know, just immediately we started talking, you know, three or four times a week. Uh, and 
it was a just sort of a, a gift to to be in, inside of each other's minds and stories uh, so much. Uh, and then, look, it's not just a time of COVID. Uh, it is a reckoning for our society. You know, um, I have two brothers, two younger brothers, and I have a nephew, and I have my father, uh, and I have a black family. Uh, and for centuries, for you know, centuries, we've been agitating, uh, and our lives, our value as fellow citizens, as just as simply as human beings. Um, uh, must be uh, acknowledged uh, and must be supported and um, and elevated. Uh, and we are in a moment where um, many of us won't accept, cannot accept uh, any return to uh, what our uh, our world, our institutions looked like uh, before COVID. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's where my that's where I'm thinking about right now, mm. you know. And and I'm also and I'm also thinking about sort of the um, look, you know, I've lost uh, family and friends of family uh, to this um, disease, uh, and many folks I know are out of work uh, or under working, uh, underemployed. Uh, and despite those very real, very true traumas, there is also something, there's a gift inside of this moment, a gift of consideration uh, and a gift for engagement. Uh, and the, um, for some of us, the, the wherewithal and energy to actually go out and do, and do the work and call for change. Uh, and so um, this pause that has a horror to it also has uh, a deep, deep opportunity in it uh, that uh, I'm grateful that so many people can be involved in this, in this movement. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and um, where were you when it started, the COVID, when you say, when you said, now this is happening for real? Where I was in, uh, when I, well, we were, when I first started to become aware of it, uh, happening in other countries. I was in rehearsals for um, a, a project called The Fray by Taylor Mack that was being produced at the Fleet Theater, which I was directing uh, with our resident company, The Bats. Uh, and we were doing it a, a giant ball pit. Uh, it is, <laughs> uh, the Fray is about, um, re really about our, our divided society. And what does it mean as a, uh, a queer esthete intellectual who leaves a uh, a society that's uh, a, 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 that's Trumpian and that is uh, um, uh, admired and sort of it's it, it's um, selfishness um, and what does it mean for him to return to that to that world uh, and is is there room for uh, a, a coming together across uh, sort of worldviews uh, as a comedy uh, in a giant ball pit. The audience was cast inside of this if they wanted to be somewhere outside. Um, and it, 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 we were just deep into making that piece. I mean, truly a pre-COVID piece, if you think about it, you know, all of our bodies inside yeah. of this ball pit together. Um, and uh, we got about, we were four previews away from opening night uh, when uh, it was absolutely clear that we as a theater industry needed to uh, to shut our doors. Yeah. And you, in a way, are responsible, right? You're the, the, the director yes. of- Oh, How I remember. Yeah, I mean, well, at that company, you know, we had, we had two casts, so there were sixteen actors, and then uh, you know our our tech teams and our staff uh, and uh, folks working in our building. Um, so, and I, I remember getting, a, um, I think Annie Kaufman sent it out. You know, I'm a, on a group of fellow uh, artistic leaders. Uh, and it was the first time I saw a document that laid out the, um, the curve and laid out mm -hmm. the argument uh, for flattening the curves and how um, institutions and governments needed to react quickly. Uh, and I remember us all going, whoa, thank you. 
we have to act tomorrow. This was like on the Wednesday. Uh, and so the Thursday we started uh, closing our theaters. Uh, oh, nice. but, and, and, yeah, overnight and I got it immediately. I sent it to uh, uh, other leadership, but yeah, overnight it was, it was just clear. Cause, but up until that point, there was sort of, I'll speak for myself. Uh, there was a sense of, oh, this can be contained. Okay, so we've identified where uh, there are outbreaks and we're containing, and there's, a, I believe there was a, um, a lockdown in, in Rockland County. Uh, and, but when getting that information, uh, it was aware, even though that our, our government ha hadn't uh, taken the leap that we needed to as, as individual uh, mm -hmm. businesses. And then you went fast to, uh, to the Carolinas or you stayed in New York? Uh, we, I was in New York uh, for about six days, uh, and uh, my my partner Bryce is also from North Carolina. His parents called us and said we were watching Rachel Maddow last night. Uh, we think you have seventy two hours to decide where you're going to um, to, to get through this. Uh, mm -hmm. We really think you should come home uh, and and be here. Uh, and so um, we made that choice. We made that choice uh, to, you know, come down to North Carolina and to, um, and, and to, you know, for for fourteen days of quarantine, and then to, um, uh, to be sheltered in place with our family. Mm, so it was your home, you know, when you said. Yes. Yes. It's a big, um, big, big decision to make. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and at the, and at that time, you know, we thought, okay, uh, this is going to be, you know, at the outside, we thought, oh, maybe maybe twelve weeks, you know, we, I, I, I can't even because I'm so in the moment, I can't even remember wh how we were coming up with those numbers and things. You know, I brought, you know, brought some sweaters and and some pants. I had no no inkling that it would be here in July and still sitting here. What what made it what did it make you think? What went through your mind? What what were you how were you experiencing these weeks? Yeah, well, I think that it, look. Uh, so one of the things that's unique uh, about the flea is that we have resident artists. You know, we have resident actors, the bats, we have resident directors, and resident writers. Uh, and the first thing I began to think about was like, okay we're artists and, 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 and our artists were starting to uh, leave the city as well. You know, um, we're an off off Broadway theater, our uh, company there, many of them are working gig jobs to make ends meet. They were, you know, uh, Uber drivers and working as uh, nannies and working at uh, restaurants. Um, and so they were starting to leave the city and, and, uh, we very, we very much as a, as a staff wanted to keep, uh, continue to keep them tethered to art making and art practice. And so uh, that first week after we closed, we started pivoting to uh, digital content. Uh, we have a long running series called Serials, uh, which is a uh, uh, serialized theater that, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, certain projects come back, you know, depending on the audience interest and, and, and certain teams start with a new one. Uh, and immediately that writing team started to reconceive of works that not only happened on, on digital platforms, but embraced distance. So, you know, either in its comedy or in its storytelling. Uh, so we, we wanted to keep giving opportunities to our artists to create and reflect on the world we were living on. Uh, so that was, that was the very first thing we thought about. And, and particularly because at that moment, uh, there was a sense that it was much more temporary than what we've come to learn, you know. Mm -hmm. If I, yeah, yeah. And and um, and did you rethink uh, why theater and, uh, and what to do in these days and these months and weeks? Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, I think that's something I think about all the time. Uh, but this is a, a very specific uh, kind of rethink. You know, uh, look, what, what I, the reason I've chosen to make theater uh, is a sense of community ritual. You know? uh, and also I love being in the room with not just 
uh, my fellow collaborators, but with our audience. Uh, the way that you make a choice uh, or an actor makes a choice uh, is deeply responding to the, the energy of the room. And, and, and as, a, as a director, you know, I think my, one of my roles is to get the audience's heartbeat beating in, in synchronicity. You know, and so I'm like in preview performances, seeing how an audience is responding in real time and making my notes about the kinds of adjustments I think we might need to take. There's something really just um, so deeply personal and human about that, that kind of work. Um, uh, but also our work is, is storytelling uh, and uh, it's about um, reflecting on uh, the artist's consideration of our world. Uh, and that, that doesn't only take shape in, uh, in, in live physical performance. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm as deeply interested in, uh, in filmed work as I am in live work. Uh, and I, I believe that the, um, the abilities of theater artists uh, can translate uh, to other mediums. Uh, and the, what I was thinking about when, as we made that pivot uh, and what we were thinking about as, as creative teams is uh, how, how do we make a pivot that's not about taking theater and putting it into this other space, but how are we as theater artists making in these other spaces? You know, so I was talking about Surreal's a little earlier. The, uh, the team didn't continue with this, um, the stories that they were writing pre-COVID, you know, they started making new material uh, and the director's role increased, you know, so suddenly here we are making, we're digital content makers. And so the, the, the vision of how to capture and visual storytelling suddenly became part of the language of our producing, you know, and also added like our, our director started to uh, become editors. And so, uh, taking the, um, our gift as theater directors and translating that to digital content makers. And I'd also, yeah, I think another thing I didn't mention is uh, in that first week I, I convened all of our resident directors and said, how do you wanna respond right now? What's important to you? Uh, and, and so how can we put the Feliz resources behind that? And, uh, and they came up with some really brilliant uh, uh, impulses. You know, one was to design a series of prompts to be put onto our Instagram page for folks to uh, create performances at home. Uh, uh, and uh, another group started to work on uh, elevating underheard voices around our, um, our globe. Uh, and so started a, pro a pro process of gathering uh, stories uh, from individuals all over uh, and artistic responses from all over as the, just the beginning process of building a new work. Uh, another group, um, when I started at the Flea, uh, it was important to me to expand our audience to include young people. Uh, I, I know that it is essential um, in our society that we, um, that we offer deeply considered performances to folks from a very young age. They deserve it. They deserve, you know, you begin our conversation talking about what great societies deserve. And I was lucky enough, even though I grew up here in this rural area, that at some point someone took me to the big city and I saw a proper play, The Snow Queen on stage. Uh, but I had also been in, you know, we could call it local theater, the pageants we were making at church, uh, that there was space for the expression of self, you know, and the expression of community and the expression of value through live performance. So that's just a, a really, I think a really long way of saying uh, it was it was important. Uh, that we start making work for young audiences. And um, they're all set in, in very specific cultures and cultural traditions. And, and one of them uh, set in, in the Russian tradition was, it went wonderfully well. And the director uh, is also a, a film editor and 
the designer was really interested in uh, how to animate the work. Uh, and so that team started uh, working on an animated adaptation uh, of, of the play, Not My Monster. Uh, they are still deep in it. Uh, our resident company, The Bats, who originally performed it, uh, did the voices and the voiceovers for that work. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we hope that very soon we'll be able to, to share that uh, with audiences in this other form. So, I mean, the, um, I, I think the, that unique positioning of having a resident company just got us thinking very quickly about uh, about how, how how we live our our lives as artists, you know. And and look, you asked a really big question, you know, that I think also is extended to my my person my work outside of the fleet. You know, I'm also a freelance director, and I'm I'm working on this uh, opera. The ritual of breath is the right to resist, uh, and it is an opera uh, that is a meditation on breath, a meditation on the loss of breath, uh, and a call to action uh, for all of us to, um, to, to breathe in uh, the, the value of all of Black lives. Uh, and our producer turned to me and my fellow collaborators is the libretto is by this incredible poet, Vivi Francis, the score by Jonathan Berger and uh, the instigating artist Enrico Riley is, if you don't know his work, he's one of our nation's best visual artists. Um, our producer turned to us and said, what do you want to do now? You know, here we are, you know, we can't make an opera, you know, spraying saliva and musicians and, and audiences. Uh, and, you know, we said this work is urgent. And, and, uh, and so now we are conceiving of it as a hybrid uh, live filmed piece. And so uh, we're building a model. Um, Mary, Mary Lou Oleski is our lead producer. She's based at Dartmouth. Uh, and Kim Whitener is a producer and they are uh, committed to us as a team, um, actually coming together, having our moment of quarantine. Uh, and not only are we gonna build the live performance, but we're gonna build the filmed performance. You know, So it is, it is a film that calls on the aesthetic of our current day, uh, which is that the, the individuals, the community making the action of this opera are also filming it with the technology that is uh, right there with them. Uh, uh, because we believe that this work, uh, as a creative team, we believe that this work can resonate as deeply through th that point of view of the person inside of the work, making a film about the work, as it will as a live interaction. Uh, it's, it's fascinating the questions that, you know, get brought up, you know, uh, around the oral experience and, the immersiveness of uh, something that's mediated by technology, uh, but all problems that we're eager to solve. And at the same time, making the live experience so that as we're able to, uh, to invite audiences into a space again, uh, they can also uh, have that experience with the work. So I mean, these are big things I'm thinking about, you know, um, and, I, and I also think about, um, you know, advocacy, you know, advocacy for this form in our, in our country, which is why, you know, you mentioned I'm a board member at Art New York. That's why I'm a board member, you know, is that uh, we have to, we have to ensure that there are resources and space for uh, artists work to exist. Mm -hmm. In the opera, I said, breathing, did you do this before the uh, George Floyd killing? Was that conceived before? Yes, uh, it was, uh, yes, it's been around, we've been working on it two years now. Two years, yeah, yeah. Is it, you know, as we said earlier that artists in a way do anticipate these things. What was that moment for you that the Black Lives Matter that of course also was there before but became and so prominent and as we now know it's the largest uh, uh, civil rights movement ever by numbers uh, that in the history of the United States. How did you experience that moment? 
Yeah, I mean, what a question. Uh, to, I don't, someone asked me recently, they said, you know, that was a, a group of folks. What's your uh, first memory of being aware of, of race? Uh, I, I personally don't have a pre-racialized memory uh, that, you know, I, I remember my dad growing up, he said, you know, son, you got to be 110%. You got to play their game better than they play it. So like, I grew up inside of a worldview that was about white supremacy and about uh, my relationship to whiteness and how I would, I would be perceived out in the world. Uh, I don't think I've, I've lived a day um, without a deep understanding that Black Lives Matter. Uh, what's infuriating <laughs> it's just, is uh, that my people still have to die for other folks to, uh, to acknowledge as much. Um, I think that uh, in, in the most recent upsurging of the moment of the movement uh, and, and this deeper inclusion of the movement in the movement, um, it's just, it's so senseless. You know, you, you see the videos or you read the reports like I, you can't take I can't I can't run I can't run I can't go for a run you know I can't open the door to my house you know I can't be engaged with respect um we're fed up we're fed up folks are fed up you know um And then I'm also just so concerned, you know, it's like, I was working on a project years ago with Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, his, his uh, play Neighbors. And we were doing the first workshop of it. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's an incendiary piece. You know, it's, it's a piece about a, a family of vaudeville, vaudeville villains, black ones who are also in blackface, who show up next door to a black college professor and his white wife and mixed race uh, daughter. Uh, and after the presentation, uh, an elder, a black elder, uh, she, she made a beeline for me and Brandon. And she says, why, why, why do you have to make this work? You know, and we were talking to her about you know, why it felt necessary to her. And she says, but we thought we had dealt with this. We thought we had gotten rid of this so you wouldn't have to engage these things. You know, it, she's talking specifically about black, you know, blackface and, and this menstrual tradition. Uh, and that is like, and, 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 and I have so much empathy uh, for that, you know, and her experience of it. Uh, because that is, that's what's underneath this is like, we've been, uh, we should not be, we should not have to, but it's my role as an artist. And, and I think our, our roles as advocates and activists uh, to continually stand up and say, hey, we ain't there yet. We ain't got there yet. You know, we haven't arrived to the other side. There's still work to be done. Yes, you worked. Yes, you had good intentions. Yes, you thought you heard, but we ain't there. And that's why we're. Uh, that's why I'm here. We're gonna have a dialogue. We're gonna have a march. We're gonna make a new piece of art. We're gonna reform this institution. You know, uh, you're gonna make sure my voice is at the table. And so now I'm transitioning into like you know this very specific place of a you know there's a a reckoning in an industry at large and specifically uh, for us at the flea uh, about how to um, not only be a diverse institution, uh, but to be inequitable and inclusive. Mm -hmm. how, how was it for you 
um, as a black artist, you took over, if I'm right, Jim Simpson, who was the husband of Sir Gunny Weaver. If I'm right, I'm not completely sure. Yes. Yeah, 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 absolutely totally. right. Yes, Jim. That is not the uh, National Black Theater or the Classical Theater of Harlem or the Federal, you know, has that tradition of, of, of black work. So how was that for you to take, to come in there and the things you found there? How was that? Well, I was eager, right? You know, uh, I had, um, I, I, had seen uh, Ed Iskander, Savannah, Ed Iskander had made um, uh, the mysteries at the flea. Uh, and I'd also seen this wonderful uh, play by Hamish Linklater, Dee Dee O'Connell in it. Uh, and so I, I, I'd seen the work of the flea, but I didn't really know it. Uh, but I also, my first internship in the theater was with Trinity Repertory Company in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, and they had a repertory company. Mm -hmm. you know, which is, so rare in our in our country and, and I just being I remember being so enthused about the idea of an ongoing engagement of artists with the theater and so uh, when the flea was looking for a leader you know two things intrigued me about the institution you know one was there's resident artist okay what is that what does that mean how does that get worked out uh, and, and not only are they resident artists uh, they're early career young folks and so they're not playing, uh, you know, the assumption, they're not playing by the rules of uh, the established, you know, uh, art makers. Um, and then also it's off off Broadway, which is, that's the thing that keeps me going as an artist is the space for uh, a, a, the novel, um, the experiment, uh, the reconsideration of the form, uh, the introduction of new voices, uh, and new perspectives. Uh, and so I was like, okay, that's the, that, that, those two things at one place, you know, let me, let me go throw my hat in the ring. Uh, and I, I had a successful interview process. Um, you know, I knew, I knew going in two things. Uh, one, which is that I wanted it to be uh, not just diverse in the people, the actors, who were around, but diverse in whose uh, stories were being shared and what audiences were showing up, okay? Uh, and, I, and I felt real buy-in from uh, uh, the producing director and the board who hired me, uh, but I also knew that it needed to become more sustainable. You know, so this is the thing about Off Off Broadway is that it exists off of the exuberance and energy and uh, specifically the flea, than the volunteer nature of folks wanting to show up and make art. Uh, uh, but I was really curious about how do we make this a more sustainable place? Uh, so uh, look, when you're coming in as a total outsider, I'd never worked at the Flea, never worked for anyone at the Flea. Uh, you know, there's a, a, a way of doing things that already exist. Uh, and, um, my dad and I, <laughs> who gives me advice, you know, we talked before uh, I accepted the position and, and talked about how I uh, could come in and, 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 and turn and shift uh, and, uh, and use the, the ways that the flea had already been successful to sort of point the direction in a different way. Um, so it, it, it meant first getting the, getting writers in that were, um, that expanded the the vision of what was on stage. It meant, I mean, the first piece I did at the Flea uh, as artistic director was devised uh, with a, a company that was majority POC about the intersection of um, the value of black lives and our ongoing climate change emergency. You know, and we got in a room and started devising works and devising pieces. And then we decided that this was not a work to just be inhabited, embodied by the actors, but also by the audience. And so we wrote a score where audience members could also take a part and, and participate in the making of the work. Uh, I feel like I've lost sight of your question. Uh, how, your, <laughs> well. how your experience was to come into existing structures, you know, that 
Yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's so complicated because you're walking into a room that's already has a, uh, a way of making and doing. And so, you know, I, I took that tact of like slowly turning, you know, by introducing new artists to the fold, introducing different forms to the fold. Uh, you know, it was also a theater that was in the, in the midst of a capital campaign, building a building. And so there was like, that was like the main uh, board priority, you know, leadership priority. And so, uh, the goal was like to get into the building, and then the final phase of the of that strategic plan would be to sustain the art making in that building. And so, you know, that's two and a half years just to get to the building, uh, and then to start the um, the, the you know, strategic plan is fundraising, and so then start the fundraising uh, for how to uh, better sustain our artists. You know, which we were doing. But you look, I also, uh, um, I walked into a, a, a theater that is uh, predominantly and historically white. Yeah. And so the, um, the work of, uh, of engagement and consideration and, uh, uh, and, and shifting um, was, um, was slow and meaningful. You know, I remember uh, a friend of mine, Claudia Alec, uh, was working with a group of artists to create this piece every 28 hours, which was part of the one minute play um, festival tradition, which was uh, this 40 plus uh, plays that dealt with the uh, horrific statistic that every 28 hours, uh, a black person was killed by a police. Uh, and, you know, I remember coming in and being like, I'm committing the flea to this. Whoa, 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 we're gonna do a free performance, you know, with 40 plays, it's only gonna happen once. And, and how does that make sense in terms of like our budget and all these things? They're like, we're committed to it. And then, you know, so you, so you do it, we make the art. Uh, and, so, and I remember a, a board member's wife turned to me and said, whoa, that was the most deeply affecting thing I've experienced. And, 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 and for her, it was like this consideration of, there was a, a couple of pieces and there were about motherhood and the mothering of black, uh, black youth. Uh, and that resonated for her. So it was like, it, it was slow and methodical and, uh, and frustrating at times. Uh, and, um, but, but I always had my sights on where we were, you know, where mm. I, I could turn an institution. You know, yeah. uh, it's thrill. Yeah, it's it's thrilling in in some ways. Also, to I want to be very honest about this. You know, uh, uh, I, I love my uh, my predominantly black spaces and creating in those spaces, and uh, and the the joy. Oh God, it's such deep joy. I, I remember this piece, Sinking Ink, that it was just so fucking joyful because of uh, our our shared uh, histories and values. Um, but there's also, uh, I've also committed myself to being a leader in non-Black spaces. Uh, and there's a, uh, a joy to that work too. And in, in between, there was also a moment, if I understand right, I didn't see all of it, that next to COVID, next to lockdown, next to the Black Lives Matter, that inside the flea was the bad, there was, you know, the the demand that we all have now for changing structures, you know, where became strong voices and you stopped and you said, no, we have to rethink. I mean, maybe if you, if you can, if it makes sense, if you tell us a bit about the experience and what it means for an institution to, to reset. Yeah. Well, look, it, it, it began with uh, individual artists speaking out, you know? Uh, I remember, you know, it was, uh, the movement was resurging and uh, I had decided, uh, or we as a staff had decided that we needed to make a statement uh, in solidarity with our black artist. I decided that um, as, as a black man living in this moment and as a leader, that that statement sh uh, should be personal. Uh, and so I, I wrote a, a draft of that statement and we decided it would start with the personal and then move to the 
institu uh, sort of institutional voice. Uh, and an artist, uh, Bren Carter, who had a really difficult experience at our theater, uh, um, you know, wrote a comment to that, you know, we reached out and said, Bren, wow, uh, I know you had a really tough decision. It's time for us to make change. Uh, why don't we have a conversation? Uh, and uh, Bryn wrote a, a public letter that uh, uh, detailed her experience. And that was the moment that, uh, that I think galvanized our, our artists. I did not think I know they've said as much. Uh, and so the other thing that's incredible about a resident artist company is that they have a stake in it. They're not just someone visiting for production and being supported by for a temporary moment. Uh, and um, our black artists led the charge, you know, and the other resident artists got behind them and they identified, began the work of identifying the ways that now in reflection, whew, whew, um, I think it's useful sometimes to have regrets because they spur on the, um, the change that needs to happen. Uh, I think that I regret that uh, we were doing the work of diversity without doing the work of equity and inclusion. Because by doing that, we created a space that did not fully support the diverse artists that were in the room. Okay. And so this is this is what is at the sort of the center of what we as the flea are working on right now, uh, but we as a, a as an industry uh, and as a field and and dare I say as a nation also need to be working on, yeah. uh, which is how do we uh, elevate our black artists in particular and our artists of color so that they are at the center of all of our considerations, not just this, you know, a story that we're, we're going to stage and support and put in front of an audience, you know, uh, very real things. I mean, look, uh, I began earlier by talking about sustainability and how, um, you know, we were making this slow journey to uh, better sustaining our artists and we were raising money and we were, you know, raising stipends. That wasn't enough. That wasn't quick enough. It wasn't fast enough. It wasn't supportive enough. It didn't give, uh, uh, folks who are historically oppressed economically and socially, uh, the same opportunity to invest and engage in the work. So immediately we have to pay our artists. We have to, you know, it's gotta happen quicker. It's gotta happen now. So any show we do from now on, artists are paid. And so we have to, we, we are taking um, this moment to completely rethink our producing model, you know? Uh, our artists have to be, our resident artists have to be on our, at all levels of leadership, including on our board, okay? And in particularly our black artists who have historically not had those seats at the table, okay? I'm one person out of the leadership team. That's not enough. That's not, that, that's not enough change, you know? That's not enough differing perspectives, you know? Uh, our uh, resident artists have to be inside of season planning. You know, I was schooled, you know, I, I, I uh, was mentored by George C. Wolf uh, when George was at the public. I had a mentorship with um, Oscar Eustace when Oscar was at the public. You know, I was inside, so I've been inside of traditional institutions, you know, the second stage. Uh, and as we've been investigating what's been revealed to me you know, that thing, my dad saying, you know, you have to play their game better than they played it. That I've internalized the white man's game. The power gets hoarded at the top. And so I was hoarding power as an artistic leader around how seasons were planned, you know. And so now with the artist making that process uh, not just more transparent, but inclusive of the resident artist. Um, and so um, I think people are, are probably interested to hear some of the specifics. And one of the things I'm really excited about is once we've actually made our way through this process, um, 
presenting our our experience to the wider field in hopes that it can be useful to them. Uh, but our artists started with demands. They said, these are things that have to change in order for us to continue working here. Uh, and there are topics for discussion. Uh, and uh, thankfully, because of the work we've done, you know, over the last couple of years, uh, our board and leadership have said, yes, right. Aha. Oh my God. Thank you for putting this in front of us. So we're in a process of listening. So that's a major point. And, uh, and listening to understand, not to respond. Okay. So taking the time to actually hear and digest. Uh, uh, we're bringing in a mediator to mediate the conversation so that we can be as, uh, as bold and brave and honest in all of our considerations. Um, we are, you know, we're looking at things that like, one of the reasons I'm at the flea is, you know, in off off Broadway is, you know, you can do challenging work that is not, uh, about commercial success, which means you can turn your attention to some really messy, urgent things. One of the plays I did was, um, about the, the friends and family of a young black man who was killed by cops. So what is the repercussion to those other folks left behind? Uh, and the feedback, some of the feedback we've gotten is that that was incredibly hard as an artist to get up six times a week and embody that. And it was a story that they were committed to, but they didn't have the full support that they would have liked to have had to do that. So, you know, it's just the way we're thinking in terms of supporting our BIPOC artists and doing the work is like, is there some ombud, ombuds person or advocate or mental health professional that is part of the creative experience that the institution is committed to? Yeah. Um, it's, it's great. Oh, I have to, oh my God. The, the best, one of the, one of the really exciting moments was uh, very early on in this process, um, we asked for a, le a listening session with the resident company uh, and, you know, we've got the listening session as we're starting it, it's on Zoom. Uh, I'm meant to begin with an, uh, an apology that I've written to the company for not um, uh, always standing up in the ways that I, I know I should have. Uh, and I'm in the first two sentences of one of our black artists interrupts uh, with, in the chat function of Zoom and says, uh, we, the, we the black resident artists of the flea, uh, would like to be uh, leading this listening session. So I'm reading this as I'm speaking. I'm like, oh, okay, sure, of course. Uh, and they take over the space. And it, it's one of the, uh, I think one of the best, most uh, generous, um, yet, yet prideful um, moments of, of artists saying we have to be at the center and we love this institution and we need it to work better you know and they had built this it was i don't want to call it a, a performance uh but you know they had written it and they had created space for all of their voices to be there and they had um, been in touch with the rest of the company and all of the non-black artists in the company had moved their screens to black standing in solidarity with them um and, and, and we got a, a chance to actually hear, to actually listen. It wasn't about leadership creating a space, but actually leaders stepping up and saying, this has to, this has to be about us right now. Uh, so that's, that's what's been inspiring about the moment is that like, everyone wants it to work. Everyone wants the flea to work. Uh, but I'm telling you, we're starting from zero. So what are our values, okay? Uh, how do we actually support those values day to day, production to production, and include our black and people of color artists at the center of those, that decision-making? We're doing radical work, you know, they're gonna get to see the, the, the operating budget. Duh, you know, that's how you set priorities. Where is the money going? You know, <laughs> how much do we need to raise? <laughs> Everyone knowing how much we got to raise to keep this, you know, 
this experiment of off off Broadway functioning in the way we want it to function, you know. But we're, we're in it, Frank, you know, we're, we're in it. I, I think that um, it'll be a few months before we can uh, even start to build this scaffold of what the new flea uh, will sit on, but it's exciting. It's incredibly exciting. And I'm, and I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that these artists were here in the room were with us, you know, so. No, I think that is, uh, it is uh, quite, uh, quite stunning and uh, quite amazing. It comes to these deep questions. Um, I mean, I know there's this term of black pessimism that says institutions will never change. We should get out. Mm. Well, you know, the philosophy of disengagement. Yeah. And also the idea of many say, yeah, even with the Black Lives Matter institutions will say, yes, it's important and they matter. And in New York City painted Black Lives Matter in front of Trump's building just last week. Um, some places in this country, actually, people go out and paint it over with black color. Yes. You know, so, yeah, uh, but um, that this your institution in a way that you say, uh, well, it's not about just the play we put them, but the way we produce it. And uh, uh, that we have to act and live in the way we, what we artistically demand and show on stage, which is radically different from the old ways. And we have a play, this is great. And there's a Actors of colors, and um, it's very unique. Uh, what you do is a real model. If theater is important, it is important because it's a model, a space of imagination, of symbolic mm. representation that also is real. If something happens in a theater, it can also happen in life. But that this now happens at the flea in the institution that you're really questioning and implementing something is so incredibly meaningful. I can only imagine also how hard it must be uh, also for you having coming in there. You brought in a lot of your artists and there's this kind of uprising where all of a sudden you are defending or responsible for things, you know, that had been ongoing or everywhere in society where, you know, this is no exception. If at all the flea was much more attuned to it. So um, I think it is quite, uh, um, quite uh, uh, encouraging to hear that you're taking it all so seriously, that you go so deep and it is connected to the COVID time. I do think that we all listen more that this happened, that the artists were questioning, what am I doing here? You know, that um, where's the money in the time where there is till the end of the year, there are no jobs for no one yeah. at the moment. So um, how did your board who maybe had no idea when they thought, let's get Nigel in. And all of a sudden there is not only what you do on stage, which they, my friend, and you did it so differently, but now the institution is changing. You say you have board members and you have your as an artist as board members. I mean, that is a, a, a stunning thing. There is a story like Tanya Bruguera, a Cuban artist said, and she was invited yeah. by the state to work. And she said, I wanted to focus on women who really do work in the neighborhood and change community and they should be honored. They also have a place. And she identified a woman who has saved countless lives. And for four weeks, she named the Tate, part of the Tate of the museum in London after her, and they put her name on. And then they said, we have to change as an institution. They kept the name and invited her to be a board member. You know, also uh, in a way, what you are doing um, is a very deep rethinking. And uh, if theater can do it, others can do it to, to really understand it. But let's say your board members who also, I guess, make a donation, I can, most probably be tomorrow a board member of uh, yeah. the flea if I give 200,000. The Lincoln Center has 86 board members. All you have to do is $250,000 a year. There's not one artist as far as I know. Um, and um, even so, then there's a small group of leadership that will make the decisions and the board members might hear it a bit earlier and have privileges. So so to, to change that idea, what, what really, what I know it's, a public call, but, but what does your institutions think? What do the board members think? What do they uh, think? Your partner well, look, think? But uh, what? Yeah, so um, I can say first they're on board, but how do we get, how do we get to on board? You know, so part of it is the work we were doing over the years. You know, the, the, our board was in the midst of diversity, equity, and inclusion training uh, before COVID came. So we were wrestling with, with these kinds of questions. You hired uh, 
uh, a mediator yep. to, to do a workshop, individual work or in a group with the board? Or? Yeah, so it was it was a mix. Um, she came in to work with our board as a whole and then in smaller groups uh, to do diversity, equity, inclusion training. So we're in the midst of asking these questions. And also uh, we were thinking about, it, look, our goal was to, uh, our goal is to diversify uh, ethnically our board. That was our, it was ethnic diversity that we were looking at. And also how to create an inclusive space that as we invited these folks to join us on the journey, uh, they felt an equal seat at the table, in their space mate. Uh, and another thing that was really exceptional uh, as two staff members came into uh, a board meeting uh, and gave an impassioned um, uh, uh, presentation about where the staff and the artist were, you know, and having these other voices from our community come in and speak. Oh, whoa, okay. So hearts are changing. There's a deeper understanding. And after that, I remember a board member saying, wait, not only do we need to include artists on the board, it's probably about time we get rid of the give get. Yes, we're all gonna keep giving our money, but if we actually want, and this is, this is great because now the board is actually having the conversation themselves as opposed to me or a consultant coming in and, and, and bringing the ideas. Uh, and so now the board is even thinking like, how do we actually make sure this table is inclusive? So like you were talking about, you know, the, the give get, that, that cannot be a prerequisite to being a leader. You know, there are other ways of giving. You know, we need it, we need it. Look, we're the, <laughs> I'm just, other people have talked about on this you know, show, the precariousness the economic precariousness of what we're doing. And that is real. You know, the flea uh, is, you know, operationally precarious and also it, particularly in this moment of not having any earned income from our productions. Um, but that is not the only thing we're about. And that could not be the only way we define uh, leadership and success. Okay. And also the idea uh, so, that member want to be also not just people give money, but to be in a dialogue, to be part of change. And most people I know yeah. who come board are great people. They are serious yeah. people, but often also are not asked to engage, as you say, staff or risen artists are not. So there is a chance to mix something, to have a, you know, an, a, a, a collision of money and ideas and possibilities yeah. and experiences. And that is richer for all of them because we do need uh, supporters and the people who do it, they are great minds. And actually also people really go to the theater, go to the art and they could yeah. find, especially in New York City, so many more other ways to support their own ideas or things than, than doing it for a nonprofit theater. So the question is, how do we do something that's also exciting that creates more energy? I think Carl Jung said about art um, has it be have a symbolic function more energy has to come out radiate than was put in like Woodstock you know people a big idea something was put in and it radiated the same concert today not wouldn't really work that way you could have the same musicians it does so but at the time something came out so artists have to find the symbolic representation the imaginary representation uh, and signifiers that create that energy and the question is how can you do that and perhaps what you guys do and what Tanya Bouguer said, perhaps changing the institution as institution, defining it as part of the art world, the way you do yeah. it, connect yeah. it. Uh, I, think, it I think the next step for us is much like what Tanya was doing. It's like, you know, one of the ways I imagine uh, our field will reemerge in New York specifically is about a deeper engagement with our geographical location. Okay, so folks may be less apt to get on a subway or get on some kind of mode of transportation to get to the theater, which is the way we thought about audiences before. Our audiences were coming from all over. Uh, and so I, I think the next step to this, because we're talking about the artists now, we're talking about the staff now, but who is our, our geographic community? 
And what is their investment? You know, folks stop by all the time, you know, like, oh, I saw the fleet. Oh, I'm finally in the doors, you know. Uh, but how are there also their doors? You know? Yeah. Mm, it's true. See, Hans Hake, the German artist, I saw that at this, I love that exhibition and he had uh, traced on the map of New York City where people who came to a museum show, to his gallery opening, where they lived. So he would mm -hmm. ask them and then went and took photos of their houses. And then he had them as a part of an exhibition, you know, and, uh, and felt that this is something of significance we don't look at. And um, yeah, also what you say, I think that is all significant and August Wilson wrote so much about it. It's not okay to just say, oh yeah, we have death of a salesman with the black cars. No, that's the white experience of the American dream because a black salesman would never believe the things Willie Loman would believe in because that's not the point. We would have to hear the story from the black, from your father, you know, and your mother who's doing silk screen and he, who, you know, now works in prison or that. Or other. So that's the stories we yeah. need to hear. And uh, there is a change. How much of this, what happened at the flea, which is a stunning thing, the eruption, the energy and the changes, how much of it has to do with COVID? You think of, would that have happened anyway? That's a great question. Um, I know that we were uh, on a path, you know, uh, on a strategic path. So I, I know that there was, that the, the economic part of this, of paying the artists, we would have gotten there at a much slower timeline, you know? So uh, the inclusion part of this, just beginning those conversations, that would have taken, oof, years. Uh, because our artist could focus and take the time in our community really, could take the time to reflect and see and look back. And also the energy of uh, our movement said, no, now, now is the time. So yeah, so yes, because of this particular confluence of events, we are moving at the pace that we should have been moving at before. And that's that's also the thing that I hope that, that we don't lose sight of in this. Uh, that this moment is teaching us something about all moments, you know, that a fear that I, I have, and I know many of my black brothers and sisters have, uh, is that, oh, you're just paying attention for the moment. And then things are gonna change and this is gonna stop being a priority. Because that's the script, that's the history. We all know that script, you know. Uh, and what's necessary now, so, so I'm excited by the fact that we all have to take this pause is we can actually practice and digest new modes of being because we have the time to actually make them our habits and, our, and therefore our values. Okay, so the, the short answer to your question is, the flea would not be making these bold choices if, the, if these events hadn't happened. Thank God they are, you know, because we were making, at least I, I was playing the institutional game. I was going at the pace that institutions move at. Feeding steering the ship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where I've spent yeah, my time of reflection. How hard was this for you personally? Did it change you? Uh, in incredibly hard. Um, you know, as a, uh, a black man, it was the, the furthest from my mind that I would be complicit in a system that didn't fully support other artists of color. Okay, that is, that has caused uh, a deep opportunity for, for personal growth and change and consideration. 
Um, and it, I mean, the thing that I think that I, I'm thinking about a lot is like, you know, I'm an activist as well as an artist, as well as an arts leader. But somehow those things like, started to get siloed. You know, my activism took certain forms. My art making was taking certain forms. My leadership was taking certain forms, you know? And so that integration of, uh, of values or that reintegration, because maybe I, maybe I separated those things in order to survive, you know? Maybe I was in survival mode to try to hold on to my seat at the table, you know? Uh, maybe I was in survival mode because only I could practice my activism in this way because to bring it in the other place would create some kind of rupture. Um, and so this reintegration space uh, and this uh, atonement and this opportunity for uh, creating something that better lives up to my own values and our values. It's, um, it's been hard, <laughs> uh, but I'm thankful. Yeah. Mm. Coming closer to the end, but what is the, if I can ask that, it's of course, if we can, the values, your values, the values of the three, if you had to put it in words, what in the moment now is being on the way, what are the, what are the, core values. I think that's important also for our international listeners to hear how would you define them? Art is necessary. Artists are essential and deserve our respect and support and and equitable treatment. We must fund it. We must, we must fund it. And um, and sustainability, like we've got to sustain folks and we have to, and, and then at the, I think, um, When, when I think about it must be equitable, uh, that each artist who wants to be able to take it, an opportunity that the flea wants to provide them has to have the resources to be able to take that opportunity. You know? And then I think, and then, and then at the, at the um, I have a value of community and communal. And that is uh, one of the reasons I chose to throw my hat in the ring at the flea is that there is a community and that community is the artist there and the audience. And so how is all of our choice making about the community? It's so not about an individual or uh, some bold vision one person has, but like I, I keep thinking that if we get to the other side of this, and there is a communal buy-in. That that's the, that's the flea I want. Yeah. 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 Then this is this is so so significant that communal buy-in, or as you said earlier, the new modes of being and uh, to contribute to that, and uh, and also for New York City, which is looking for its identity. You know, it's, uh, what will happen in this. One million jobs are lost in New York City. Mm. Uh, rents are actually going down. The latest statistics must be saying, you know, that which has never happened. Um, many people will work from home. Offices will be empty. It also means there will be more available. And uh, so maybe it will be closer to Berlin. Maybe there will be, again, a chance to reinvent and, uh, and uh, that city that everybody, the Bonnie Marancas of the world tell us, you know, you had no idea how great it was in the 70s. It was all the complications, you know, this was a different town. But um, I think, again, uh, art will play a great role. And this is a great city, and it, but it has to reinvent yourself. And what you are doing there, um, that kind of painful birth and uh, all the complexities in it, you know, are, part, are really part of that. And I can only hope other institutions 
would do the same. Uh, they most probably won't, um, but they could. And this is something we can, uh, we can learn. So this is why your experiment or your journey over um, is of a much larger significance also what will come out of it. And, um, and perhaps also then what additional changes it will bring in, um, in leadership and, and others and models of, uh, of creating work or the way you produce it um, is also not separate from the aesthetic outcome. And, uh, and, uh, and, and as someone said in our show, uh, um, we want to produce something, but we also want to know, hey, how are you? How are you feeling to yeah. the artist? Something to combine these two things, the laundromat project, you know, Kemi and, uh, and they say, you know what, so you do something, but how are you also? In, in that same time, something very simple, but so complex and, um, so this is a, a stunning. What 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 are your ideas? Are you, what are your own projects, or just the flea? Or is there in that time where you stop down something where you say this is something I see, or do you say this is now a moment where we like what Chief Sitting Bull did? He, that's why he was named Chief Sitting Bull in the middle of a battle. He sat down and smoked a pipe because he had to rethink. He didn't yeah. get injured, luckily, and then went back and they won the battle by that, what he did. And, uh, um, yeah. and so, um, so w w what is on the horizon? Do you, is something you can already share or is that really not the question at all at the moment? It's not the question. You know, this is the time for consideration, you know, and you can imagine there are board members and funders also have the same question you have. What's next? What, so what comes out of this? Mm -hmm. Right now is the time to listen and to rethink. Okay. Uh, because we have to, we have to serve our company and the black artists have to be at the center of that and elevated inside of that. Uh, and we have to reemerge when, when, we've, when we've got that vision. You know, uh, when we've heard each other, truly. So, you know, of course, you know, I, I hope they choose to make something. I hope the artists choose to, to make a new thing. I can't tell you what that is, you know. So like, like other institutions, yeah, we've got commissions out there and things that could, could happen, you know. But what do our artists need? So I'm listening and we're considering and we're putting up plans and ideas. So let's wait, we got time. I mentioned Annie Kaufman earlier. She sent me another email recently uh, in which you know, she's part of this group that's rethinking timelines. What are the production timelines? You know, how do you actually get it? And, Frank, you and I had this conversation years ago during Prelude, which is like, in, uh, there is a scarcity energy in America around time and around resources. And it creates certain uh, consideration or certain um, uh, factors that control art making here. And we got to slow down. We got to be more intentional. You know, so the leaders over at the la laundromat project saying, how are you? That moment of check-in. Oh, that was, that's another fascinating thing about this pandemic. As we start, you know, we would get together as a staff on a Zoom or on a, as an arts call and we would begin with a check-in. Now, why weren't we doing that before? Why wasn't it valuable enough to say, hey, how you doing? What are you coming today with? Somehow the script had been, I remember, I remember learning this script in my theater training. You leave it at the door. You leave all that at the door. You come in the room for something else. No. We're gonna bring our full selves here. We're gonna check in with each other. We're gonna listen to understand, not to respond. And then we're gonna make some great art. Well, that's um, that's uh, that's uh, significant and important, and to hear and uh, also to understand and uh, 
to, to, to take that with you. Really, um, thank you uh, for sharing, really, Nigel. Thank you for taking the time and for your, for your openness, uh, your, this intense uh, experience you are going through to share it um, with us and to uh, also make us aware of uh, what you have learned because this is significant um, in what you what you do and, uh, and hope that also listeners, people, artists, institutions, and everybody in their lives really think through what that means if that's an authentic change also what's happening in our life or the institutions you are in, they are in, I am in. And, um, some statistics also do say there's more money or the same money in the US as it is in Europe, but it's, you said, differently distributed. Artists often are the curators, they are in Europe, they are the leaders of the theater, they make sure they do, they are the board members you have, but the money of course comes from the city or the state, so it's very unfair, you cannot compare this to here. There are also disadvantages um, about it, you know, and uh, here is that, need to entertain that people love have a good time in berlin and sometimes people have a good time and love it's suspicious the artist like, what did i do wrong you know uh, and uh, as I, you know people will say it's a populist you know so it's so but there's some connection between these things and i think we have to find new ways and new forms and i think what you guys are doing there is really an experiment a real search for a new form that goes beyond formal structures of performances or presentations. I'm really curious as everybody what will come out. So really, really thank you. And yeah, and I also remember Brendan's play, The Neighbors. We did one of the early readings, if not the first reading yeah. at the <laughs> yes. audience members who were upset. And uh, so what the hell did we do fight for? I and mean, you do this, you know, uh, the community members who came and um, he said, well, we have to deal with this if we like it or not. And the idea of neighbors, in the very early on in some of the um, early writings of uh, about America, people from Britain who went back and forth, they said the idea of America was the nearer neighborhood that you mm. were near to your neighborhood and then it was an old Europe, where it's class system it was divided, or, you know, royal aristocratic structures, dictators, uh, military leaders. So, um, so I think this idea of the nearer neighborhood that what you also put out is something that's of real significance and also that's what makes New York, New York, that we have that. So thank you really um, for this, um, what I think um, really significant and, uh, and important uh, 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 talk. We will um, continue um, in our big um, uh, mission um, of uh, our travel around the world and um, we will have uh, tomorrow um, with us uh, Jean-Claude van Italy, who is a Belgium-born playwright, fled World War II with his family, I think the Jewish family, came to New York and did the most significant many states, anti-Vietnam play at La Mama at the time, America Hurrah, then went on to write many significant works later on that the Day of the Dead, uh, the Book of the Dead performance, and has in Chantigar a, a retreat upstate New York, and he feels theater has to as change of form also get closer to the spiritual side that uh, um, have been a little bit lost. You know, what you also mentioned, your early upbringing, your connection, what inspired you to come to it. This is something perhaps we also all should listen to. So Jean, at least that's well a great artist, I think. Um, so um, that will be um, important. And um, for next week, we have, uh, uh, again, uh, a, bit, a look at New York, Harry Dice, which will be with us, Ping Chong, and um, we'll be with the great Mabu Mines, uh, mm -hmm. Lee Brewer and, uh, and Maud Mitchell will be with us. A very significant European director, Tiago Rodriguez from Portugal, a very, very important artist. And a significant young director from Berlin, Susanne Kennedy, who uh, really is a stunning representative of what I call, or we call here, the, the children of the digital age for the ones who also are producing your work. She really incorporates the VR experiences experience of the digital but also of um, of um, a generation that grew up so radically different that we did on on a stage where she creates worlds that try to uh, help us understand that everything we see is also created through our headsets through our vr system and the way what you say this change that takes place that to understand we see the world like through a computer game like through a vr because that's what is in front of us but actually we are composing it it doesn't exist it's kind of a dream like thing what our brain puts together we need to understand that it's a particular experience and everybody has a different one and we have to respect and understand and get close on art 
can uh, can be that. Susanna Kennedy so uh, will be um, with us. I think it's on next uh, Tuesday. Again, Nigel, thank you. This was a really um, so important also for me to her. It gives me hope. Uh, it gives me also uh, lots to think about, also for me and myself. And if there's any change, we have to make ourselves a change that is authentic. Yes. It comes first. And, and then also look at institutions and see what does radical change really, really mean. And what you do there is uh, of significance and an ongoing project. Uh, and of course, like everyone, experiment with failures and back and forth, but it's to, to take these steps. And the first steps in the long journey are the significant ones. But, uh, Thank you, Frank. Good beginning of the work have done, uh, we say. Uh, in, in, in so thank you, and thanks to HowlRound for hosting this, Vijay, Thea, and uh, Travis, uh, San Yang, and Andy from the CETL team, and to you listeners, really, thank you for staying with us. Uh, what Nigel had to say is of real significance and importance, and it stands for so much more than the world of the specifics he talked about, and it's something to really consider, to keep with us and listen, and perhaps also to go back and also something to, to support. Thank you all. And I hope you will all stay safe, do wear a mask, uh, stay tuned. And um, tomorrow is another day. And uh, see you all on Monday. Bye-bye.